Good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us in the, the Wi-Fi hacking talk. Um, my name is Daniel Cuthbert. Um, I am the COO of a company called SensePost. And for the best part, we perform offensive security assessments. And we look at tearing and breaking things apart on the internet. And we've been doing it for 15 years now. Um, prior to that, I helped start a, a little organization called OWASP. So I've been involved in the, the security assessment scene for a while. And for the last three years, my area of research has been looking at tracking and profiling people on the internet. And that's anything from extremists using social media to generally messing around with Wi-Fi. Uh, and the basis of this talk is a piece of research that um, my two colleagues, Dominic and Ian, have put together and I've helped with. And it's about helping us own the airwaves a lot easier. So, the slides have to start with the obligatory uh, legal note. Uh, there is a legal disclaimer. Um, I am going to be doing some Wi-Fi tests in this room, so if you really don't want to be involved, please turn your Wi-Fi off. There is a very fine line that's to be crossed. Um, unfortunately, when it comes to interception and modification of anything, it's kind of illegal. Um, I will not be doing that in this talk, um, but I am going to be proving to you how and what we've done works. So it's currently running in the background. All it's doing is going through some very basic stuff. So if you're not interested in being involved, please turn your Wi-Fi off now. Thank you. So a lot of people today ask me, why Wi-Fi? Like, Wi-Fi is such a, an old subject to talk about, right? It's easy to hack. Everybody knows how to own Wi-Fi. Why the big interest? And for us, it's, it might, might have been easy to attack a long time ago. But if you look at how many devices today have Wi-Fi, right? There's 800 million new devices every year deployed with some form of Wi-Fi capability. You have smart cities, such as the one in Singapore and London, etc. So the world of Wi-Fi is getting quite exciting when it comes to owning stuff. And if you look at modern devices now, um, we gave training over the last two days, nobody has Ethernet anymore, right? So everything connects and communicates using Wi-Fi. And everybody has got one of these, um, and more so in Asia where you'll have more than one device. So the lure of owning and targeting a human being who uses a device that communicates via Wi-Fi is actually quite appealing. And you know, this is the promise of Wi-Fi hacking, right? There should be vulns at every single layer of the OSI stack, from the RF signal to the passwords to credentials to getting access and doing man in the middle. It should be really easy. And if you talk to a lot of people, it's like, yeah, Wi-Fi hacking, that's really easy. You know, you get creds falling from the sky. And that's kind of where we came up with the idea from this talk, manna, you know, manna from heaven, right? For the last 13 years, the security industry has been looking at researching and trying to find ways to break Wi-Fi, right? But the thing is, you don't have creds falling from the sky, right? As of a couple of months ago, before we released manna at DEF CON, you know, it was actually quite hard to do full interception of modern Wi-Fi networks and to pwn a device and gain access to credentials, right? And we thought, well, that's, that's Pretty rubbish, we need to change that. So if we look at all the vulnerabilities and all the tools that have been around, right? Starting right at the beginning, Connect, okay? Dino and Sean in 2004, so that was 11 years ago, released Karma. And back then, Karma was quite cool because we didn't have the proliferation of mobile devices like we do currently. We had laptops. So it was quite easy to go around with a Pringle can like I did back in the day and drive past GCHQ and MI5 and MI6 and do war driving. Because it's, it's normal, it's what you did back then. You might have got a lot of weird glances, but there was a vague hope you could do some war driving and catch somebody and own them if they were using something like WEP or no security back like it was then. On the crack side, you had Josh Wright who made a sleep in 2003. Josh and Brad wrote Free Radius WPE in 2008, and then Moxie in 2013 gave us Cloudcracker. And then on the interception side, you had Doug Song's DSNF. Now, I remember when Doug released it, and DSNF was amazing at the time. Back in 2000, if you gain access to a network, you launched DSNF, and there were creds raining in left, right, and center. Okay, and it was a great tool, but that was in 2000, that was 15 years ago. And then, fast forward to 2007, Rob and uh, Rob Graham released Hamster and Ferret, which worked really well, and then Moxie came back with a smacker and gave us SSL strip and SSL sniff. So we finally started to see all these creds falling from heaven. But if you notice, they were all in the early 2000s, right? Since then, nothing's really worked, except in 2010, Eric Butler gave us Fire Sheep. 
And there was a brief moment in time when, when you were bored at the airport like myself, you'd launch up Fire Sheep and you'd start collecting Facebook profile cookies and indeed everything else. And it was cute for a couple of months, but then the application security world got wind of it and shut that down, rightly so. So if nearly every single layer of the stack is vulnerable, right, why are we not getting credentials falling at our feet left, right, and center? All of you use Wi-Fi here. I've been doing my testing over the last four hours, and there are a lot of access points being called out for, right? So why have I not collected a massive database of credentials? Simply put, because the industry got better at protecting your details. So the expectations versus reality are, are pretty you know, different. So if we look at why it failed, right? If we look at Karma, okay, it's old code and devices probeless. I'm gonna go into detail of why devices do this and how we've come about fixing that. If we look at free radius WPA, it's very old code, and anybody who's ever deployed it knows how hard it is to set it up, right? It's not a quick and easy thing to get up and running. DSNF, well, DSNF says it all. If you wanna go and sniff MSN Messenger creds, that's really cool, but I doubt you'll find anybody using MSN Messenger anymore. Same goes for Hamstone Ferret, and same goes for Fire Sheep, all right? They barely work, and they're not updated. And then finally, if we look at SSL Strip and SSL Sniff, two very, very cool tools, but the problem is the industry got better. They were defeated by HSTS and certificate pinning. And it becomes very hard now when you're on a network, or you're on a mobile network or an access point to successfully intercept SSL communications. So at SensePost, Ian and Dominic and myself, we decided, right, we need to put some effort into this and we're gonna fix karma. We're gonna fix the interception part. And we created this toolkit called MANA and basically MANA is based off a lot of code modifications we did to Host APD, which is version 2.3. Host APD is the, the software access point. And the toolkit's been released for a couple of months, and last night we pushed a whole lot of updates into our GitHub page, so you can pull it down now and start playing with it. There is Dominic and there's Ian. Um, so I'm gonna teach a lot of people here, I'm sure, to suck eggs. Um, how many Wi-Fi hackers in the room? There's not one, there's one Wi-Fi hacker. All right, cool. So we're gonna be talking about Wi-Fi, yeah? I'm not talking about 3G, I'm not talking about RFC, I'm not talking about Bluetooth or anything else. I'm literally talking about 80211, ABG, NAC, et cetera, in the 2.4 gigahertz range, right, or five gigahertz. So as a primer, it's really important to understand there's three types of packets when it comes to Wi-Fi hacking, all right? Just three. As a blonde, that's really helpful. The first one is data. That kind of does what it says in the tin. That's the stuff that carries your data across the airwaves, right? The next one is control. Now, that stops collisions happening. So if any of you were in the keynote, and you would have noticed there was last count 600 and something access points being probed for, at least in my research. And when you have a big room like that, it's really important to make sure there's no collisions that happen, right? It's just general netiquette. The one we're interested in is management, and that's probes and beacons, and this is really important. So if we look at the current um, way of doing it, when you pull out your mobile phone, and you turn your Wi-Fi on, because nobody has it turned on all the time, right? When you turn your Wi-Fi on, your phone does a couple of things. First out, it sends out a broadcast request, right? And it says, hey, home network, are you there? All right, and it sends out, and any access point out there that actually belongs to that goes, yep, yep, that's me. And then you get a probe request that goes out, okay? If you then look at what happens, your phone then sends out a directed probe request, right? And the access point it wants to connect to sends out a directed probe response. And this is really important. This is how modern Wi-Fi works. And then the association request and response happens. Now, the problem with Karma, right, is that a lot of the time devices will probe for a preferred network list. And effectively what that is, is that every single network you've connected to gets stored on your phone. And in 2012, uh, a colleague of mine, Glenn and I, built a snooping framework called Snoopy which we presented at Black Hat and DEF CON. It was on CNN and quite a few other channels. And we exploited this preferred network list. But the problem is, is that modern devices no longer send out directed probe requests, right, for obvious reasons. But the older karma attack would say, listen, phone would go, hey, home network, are you out there? And I'd go, yeah, I'm home network, Let, let's party, all right? And that's how the old karma attack worked. It was great in 2006, and it worked up to like 2009, 2010. But then things started changing. 
So it became a lot harder to start owning Wi-Fi networks, which is a bit disappointing because hacking Wi-Fi should be fun, right? There are so many different areas actually owning an organization or a human being when it comes to Wi-Fi. So then um, Thomas wrote Aircrack. So he's that gentleman there. And then Robin Wood, DigiNinja, decided, well, he was going to fix a few of these things. And he patched the first um, bit of Karma to make it work a little bit better. But it just it wasn't working that right. The problem with Karma is that it looks like a fake access point, right? It also doesn't respond to broadcast requests. So it's a bit like that ginger head or the ginger person at a nightclub who's used self-tan. You know they're fake, you know it's not real, right? Modern mobile devices won't listen to directed probes for open, non-hidden access points, right? They first got to respond to a broadcast probe. So that makes it a little bit harder. So what we did with MANA, right, is we built this framework and our access point, our evil access point, which is currently running here, right, needs to do two things. It needs to respond to the broadcast probe as well as the directed probe, right? And then when we were playing around with MANA and broadcast probes and everything else, we figured out, well, we could send out different probe responses for different networks, ESSIDs, right? Because that's how, let's say, the Black Hat network works. There is the BHAP, uh, BH and there's probably 10, 20 access points up there all sending out that ESSID, which is great. So let's pretend to do that. Then we decided, well, let's get a little bit more clever about this. So we patched host APD, and Ian went through a very horrible period, because for anybody who's ever looked at the host APD code, the developers obviously went through the same process where if it's really hard to write the code, I'm going to make damn well sure that it's impossible to read the code. There's no comments or anything else. So Ian went through a very horrible period of lots of swearing and alcohol and cigarettes. But he found out a way, and he patched it. And we do two things. Our evil access point watches out for directed probes. But it doesn't just stop there. We then decided, let's collect all those directed probes and store them in a hash, right? A per Mac hash, because we want to use that later, right? Then we build up our own version of your preferred network list in our access point. So right now, whoever's left their mobile phones turned on, you are currently having all your preferred network lists that you've ever connected to stored in our little database, and we're using that against you. So right now, your phone is probably going, hey, listen, home network, you're there, right? Directed, and our karma access point's going, yep, that's me. And we then use that against you. So that's pretty cool, and um, I've got a video to show how this works. So this is a modern Android device, right, in an emulator, because there's one thing I've learned in presenting over the last nearly 20 years, you never do live demos, ever. So on the left, on the right, you can see a device, and you can see a network that we've connected to before called Sensepost Manor. So we're going to start at Manor, and Sensepost Manor is not in range, okay? And we search for Wi-Fi networks, um, on the left-hand side, you can see the PNL that we're now storing in the network a database, and you can see sense post manner has connected. Okay, so that's the first important. Oh. That's the first important thing. Okay. Sorry, it's going to start again. So we can now we fix Karma, right? So Karma now works with modern devices, and just to prove that the old-style Karma works, so it's going to associate. You'll see it in the, the left-hand side. Associates, karma successful, thank you very much. We're going to create a network that we've never ever connected to before. Okay. We're going to call this MANA Sense Post. Again, it's not in my preferred network list, so I know that effectively there should never be an access point out there. And you'll see in a second, pretty much instantly, I get associated, I'm connected, I get given an IP address. So we worked, we fixed Karma, it's really good. You can go forth and do that, get the patches, and start doing basic Wi-Fi purge. So in 2012, Glenn and I gave a talk called Terrorism, Tracking, and Privacy, and Human Interactions at 44Con. And we became quite obsessed with how people were using mobile phones. Uh, this was 2011 when we started. In, in truth, we wanted to build a low-cost version of Palantir. Um, Palantir's got billions of, you know, venture capital funds. We had a couple of thousand pounds. So what we did was we built a series of drones. So we wanted to take Wi-Fi hacking from a singular laptop 
and make use of drones and then send that to London. And we went out to London in rush hour between 8 a.m. and 9 a.m. at key stations. And, you know, Sarah was one of the people that sat there for an hour with a little drone. And we caught nearly 80,000 people in our net. All right? And, and what we could do with Snoopy, Snoopy was we decided, well, let's start getting clever. How can we start spying on people? All right? And this was pre-Snowden. And Glenn built a drone that had a Snoopy drone on underneath. And you could fly it over large groups of people like you did um, at concerts. And you could start mapping people out. And how it worked was, so this is the Multigo interface, is that we could write a single com command and control center that allows us to put drones anywhere. And the idea behind the drones was they were cheap, less than 100 pounds, they were throwaway. We made sure they were secure, they connected over VPN, and effectively they become a dumb client. So what we did was we put them everywhere, right? And then I go into my Multigo interface and I say, right, show me all the drones you've got in a certain location. And it goes out and pulls them off, and then I start doing my mining. I'm saying, all right, show me which clients have associated. Show me which clients I'm giving internet access. And there were two parts to Snoopy, which is quite interesting. The first was the passive side. Bear in mind, we did this in London, and I don't really like getting arrested. It's, it's quite annoying. So we made sure that was legal. But then the, the evil part of us thought, well, what's the worst we could do? So we thought, let's make it completely nasty. Let's give that person full internet access. Let's pretend to be one of the networks they're probing for, you know, the modified karma attack. Let's give them internet access, and at the same time, let's intercept all the traffic. And we did that. We used you know, basic SSL strip. We injected um, all the JavaScript coming across the wire. We would inject a malicious JavaScript in there and let the user browse. And, and it worked really well. And the nice thing about that is that we could start to map out people, like where they were. We could figure out in large groups of people who of those thousands of people had connected to a single access point. So we decided to target um, the, the organizers of the 44 conference without them knowing. And we decided, you know what, we're going to see where you guys are doing. So I think it's fair. If you run a security conference and you use Wi-Fi on, it's fair that you're going to get owned. Um, so we did. We, we owned a lot of them. And we looked at their Facebook profiles and went through there. This is all through our little drones. And it was an interesting story. I managed to social engineer my drone to the front of the registration desk by going up to one of the ladies and saying, listen, my phone really needs a charge. Can you just plug it in for me? Because it was right at the hall of everybody walking in. And it worked a treat. And then, you know, going through this with the, the power of Multigo, I could start to blow up and see where people were interacting and who they're interacting with and their friends. Now, if you take this to the next level, if I start targeting you as an organization, I can see who the weak spots are. I can pretend to be Bob's friend because I can see it there. But this changed a lot of things, right? So Snoopy came out. We were in talks with Apple and Google about it. And then I think 18 months ago, there were a series of bins in London that decided to start tracking your movements via mobile phone just down the road from the office. And that's when we realized, wow, stuff is going to start changing. And it did. iOS 7 came. And Apple made bold claims saying that, listen, we're going to make it more secure. And you're going to get MAC address randomization and everything else, which to be honest, it's utter bullshit. We've just not seen that happen. But Apple did one weird thing that confused us all. all right? Apple did not probe for hidden networks, which if you understand a lot about how hidden networks work, is that hidden networks, devices will not send out a broadcast request with the ESS ID or anything else in there. Right? But there has to be a way to connect to it. And what we noticed was is that Apple was not doing this. So Dominic went into a little bit of a, a funny phase where he tried to build a Faraday cage. So he went to the hardware shop and bought a rather large amount of chicken wire. And he's building this Faraday cage on his desk. It's not working. Then he realized he was pretty crap at maths. And he had like a whole lot of Faraday chicken wire on his desk. And he got confused. And then he thought, well, maybe they were doing it by location. Right? But then he noticed in his house he had an old boiler, water boiler. And when he walked behind the water boiler, the network signal was dropped. So he was thinking, wow, I've got my perfect Faraday cage. So there he is, busy doing this, stepping out, stepping back. And his wife walked in and thought, what the hell are you doing? And then he realized Apple got around this by not sending out direct probes for hidden networks unless there was at least one hidden network being broadcasted by an access point. Right? So that was quite easy. right? So all we did to MANA was we patched HostABD to run a hidden network at any given time. 
What this means is that iOS devices, even 8.2 and 8.3, once they see a frame for a hidden network, they happily give up the preferred network list and go from there. Now, the other interesting thing that we noticed with preferred network lists is that there didn't seem to be any specification as to how long networks were stored in these lists. When we were doing Snoopy, we noticed that access points are connected to four years ago on completely different devices were being probed for. These were access points in China, in Thailand, where it had not been in a very long time. So we got in touch with Apple and said, listen, how do you fix this? And their response was, you don't. The only way we could do it is that if we pretended to be each network and go forget this network. Because when you go to clear network settings, it doesn't delete your preferred network list, which is a bit annoying. Then we thought, well, how else we can fix the, the hidden network thing? And then Ian went into a thing where he thought, well, what happens if we just deal off all the users? which is technically possible, but it's not the best netiquette type thing. Remember, we're talking about stealth here. We don't want people to know that there's somebody messing with the Wi-Fi. Then we did one last thing. So remember we talked about the fact that we store our, every single MAC address that we see, we store the PNL into a little table hash. Well, we thought, wouldn't it be pretty cool if at least in a large room like this, which is currently running, we take everybody's preferred network list and broadcast it to everybody? And, and this is a, 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 a video, and it's quite easy to enable. It's a simple flag in the Karma option. So I enable it there, and I start it up again. And you'll see on the right-hand side the Android device. So there's a whole lot of devices stored in its PNL. And the problem with loud mode is that when you're in a large room, um, I was doing it during the keynote. And I was sending out nearly 1,000 access points every minute. So it does start to break. And unfortunately, this little device cannot send out that many frames. But it, but it works, and you can start to see. You can't really see it on this one, but I'm sure if a lot of you have turned on your access or your Wi-Fi at the moment, you'll notice that a hell of a lot of access points popping up. So that's quite cute, and it works. It also increases your attack surface. Then the next one we wanted to look at was, and this was an interesting story. Um, I was in the office and I needed to get some images. I, I like minimal slides. So we have an intern, and my idea was, if I could get an image that portrays securing Wi-Fi cards, and I thought, I know, I'm gonna put it in a condom, all right? I didn't have any condoms in the office, I'm married, I don't need condoms. So I said to the young intern, who's only 20, 21, I was like, Jonathan, go to the shop and get me some condoms. So he's like, all right, then you're the boss, off you go. Then, you know, there's my idea, like, put it in a condom, because that's really cool, it, like, it works really well, clip arts, you know, it's like hackers and hoodies. Then I get a text message from Jonathan, saying, Tesco only have Durex at £5.25, I, I gave him £4, I don't really buy condoms, I don't know how much they cost. I didn't bring in any more money, no anybody else that should do them, or should I come back for more money? This is a weird text to send to my boss. So it just shows that interns can do stuff when you really make them do. So, with loud mode and the PNL, we fixed Karma, right? Um, last year was its 10 year anniversary, and you know, we said to Dino, listen, great tool, it's really cool, but we fixed it, so now Karma works for all modern devices. Um, I've not talked a lot about laptops, because laptops and other devices really don't do any of the cool stuff that mobiles do. Attacking laptops has never been easier. All right, so Karma works, you can go ahead and enjoy that, pull that down now. But, we didn't want to stop there. So we thought, okay, we're doing the connect part. That's easy, we've owned that, we've intercepted that. But modern devices don't use open networks anymore, right? Unless they're cons like this. And they don't use web, because let's be honest, who uses web? They make use of secure networks. So I'm talking uh, PSK, EAP networks, et cetera, right? And the problem with Karma is that Karma doesn't work with modern secure networks, right? Because what mobiles do is they know that I connected to SensePost in London, and we use uh, WPA PSK, and then it does a compare against the name, saying the certificate, saying, is this all cool? And it gets something back from Karma and says, I'm not going to connect to you, sorry. So there's no auto-join. And we thought, well, that, that's pretty sad, because that's the modern Wi-Fi world. So how do we fix this? So we decided, in MANA, let's build a, a bit of a more auto opponent own option. So we decided, let's use some of the cracking tools out there. You know, we talked about a sleep and everything else. The problem with those tools is that they didn't move forward in our ability now to crack stuff. 
you know, if you look at using Amazon DC2 to crack stuff, Moxie's Cloud Crack, which is an amazing resource for smashing peep and MS Champ, right? $17, you'll pretty much get it back. Let's use these, right? So what we decided was the next phase of Karma was that we're going to catch any e patch, right? The nice thing is the device will fail initially, but it will always reconnect, right? And then what most people do is they use free Radius WPA, right? But we thought this is weird because Host APD has its own radio server. So why don't we pull it all in-house, yeah? So let's do our cracking. Let's capture the hash. And this could be WPA, WPA2, EAP, et cetera. Pull it in, crack it, and then reuse it, OK? So this video, I'm going to show you a modern secure implementation. So on the right-hand side, we've got the device. And you can see the always on secure, which is a secured network. And I'm going to show you the details. It's PEEP and MSChat v2. And it's got a user, and the password is unchanged, right? On the left-hand side, I'm going to start, or well, I'm going to tell the um, host APD EAP user. You can see it's an empty file at the moment. And then I'm going to start MANA, but I'm going to this time tell it to auto crack an ad. So what it does is the user tries to connect using our modified Karma. It captures the hash. Then what it does, it puts it in, and it does it really fast here. It puts it in, it tries to crack the hash. Once it's cracked the hash, it puts it into the EAP file and then it tries to associate back to that network. And you can see there, the user has connected, always on secure, happy days. Now, we've decided to modify this so that we can push it out to um, CloudCrack or any one of your password you know, hacking, crashing rigs, right? And it does it automatically. And obviously, it requires a, a relatively good you know, password file to use. But what we found in testing is that most people, when it comes to mobile phones, and I'm sure a lot of you here will slightly agree in your head, you don't ever choose a really, really long, strong password when it comes to a mobile phone. We all did probably right at the start because it was quite cool, but it gets really boring after a while when you're having to type a 27-character password in with different characters. It doesn't happen. So generally, people will choose a less secure password. So then the next problem is, right, so we, we've got the connect thing. OK, we, we've smashed that. We can do quite well with secure networks. But let's be honest now. How many of you here have got work-based mobile phones. You can put your hands up. How many of you take your personal mobile phone into the office and plug it into a laptop or something to charge up? Sweet. I want to own all of you, right? Because that's what I want to do when it comes to hacking Wi-Fi, right? So I want to mad in the middle, right? So I've already connected your phone. I've got it to connect to me. I've already got your pre-shared key. But the man in the middle part has become really, really hard, right? Because modern devices now check to see if a connection is legit, right? So the tools like DSNF, Fireship, et cetera, don't work, right? Car Metasploit only gives us a handful of creds, right? And you're probably only going to do it if some idiot's connecting to their POP3 or something else. Um, incidentally, when we did Snoopy testing three years ago at Black Hat, um, we asked Black Hat guys, kind of listen, can we run it on the network? We thought, if you're coming to a conference called Black Hat, and you want to do something normal, you're a bit special in the head. So we ran it, <clears throat> and in true fashion, you had people buying stuff on Amazon, and there was POP3 credentials for an insurance company. It was like, wow, people still do this. So that's great. Old school attacks might still do this. But we're after modern implementations, right? And HSTS defeats SSL strip. And I thought, well, this is really annoying, because we want to start doing this. So how do we fix this? So a guy called. Um, Thomas Roethlisberger um, developed a tool called SSL Split. And that's why there's a hamburger there, so just so I can remember his name. And SSL Split is an amazing, amazing tool. And we thought, we need this inside MANA, right? Because we want to start doing interception. And the nice thing about SSL Split is it does it for non-HTTP ports too. So for most modern devices that use SSL for all the connections, SSL Split works for that. So what we decided was, we need to somehow get it so that the user is actually connecting to us, right? So we need to create a man-in-the-middle proxy with no upstream, all right? So a known fact, when you connect to a Wi-Fi network, what's the worst, first thing your device will do? It, yep, yeah, it tries to bust out. It's a bit like Skype. Skype's the best backdoor tool out there, because if there's a way out of the network, Skype will find a way. Same thing with these, right? So they call out to see if the internet connection is legit, or if there's a captive portal. So 
for BlackBerry, Android, Windows, they're quite easy. Um, for those that still use BlackBerry, they connect to one site. So it was quite easy to that. iOS, on the other hand, you've got to give Apple. They're pretty good. Um, they hit one over 200 random sites. We know this because we try to map out every single site that Apple could do. And then they make different things. For every two or three attempts, they randomly change the user agent. So it took us a very, very long time to work out how to get around this. And we did that. So inside MANA, when you run the no upstream option, we've got our own captive portal. Right? So we've got an Apache V host with all the ones for BlackBerry, Google, um, et cetera, and Android, uh, Apple. And basically, it will connect to that. And our MANA captive portal says, yep, I'm here. There's internet access. Thank you very much. So your phone goes, sweet, I've got internet access. All right? But we want credentials. We want to man in the middle of you, right? So we thought, how do we do this? Well, let's create a fake captive portal, right? And we're going to go down the old social engineering thing, right? We don't want to interfere with any normal comms, right? We need to auto um, man in the middle interactions, right? So we use Whisper to open the browser early, and we present them with our own captive portal, which is not that because that looks like a really well-designed one, and we definitely didn't do that. And then we thought, well, OK, so if we've got credentials, what's the next thing we want to do, right? And we noticed some weird interactions, the way that mobile devices handle root CAs. So we thought the best way of doing full interception is that we can push in a rogue CA into a device. Well, then we're winning, and it, it's game over. You know, we're happy days. And we thought, well, this should be quite hard to do, right? You know, everybody wants to be the NSA and do that, but to be honest, that's actually quite hard. Well, what we found was something completely different. Um, and look, everybody knows Android is not a, a secure mobile operating system. That, that's a given. When Google engineers are admitting they're in a built-in for security, we kind of expected installing a root CA should be a little bit harder, but alas, it's not. So we have a captive portal that's got a malicious root CA, and we can push that in. So. Here's where it starts to get cool. All right, on a mobile device, uh, SSL strip works because it's got, well, SSL strip doesn't work because of HTTP strict transport policy. All right, so what HSTS does, and I'm sure a lot of you have seen this, is that it tells the browser connecting to it that this site should only ever be connected to on port 443, right? And so the old Moxie tool worked by, let's say, me going to accounts.google.com, Right? I type in https.google.com, SSL strip would take it back down to HTTP, and then I could do interception that way. Right? That was cool, but the browser manufacturers got better and stopped that. Well, HSTS tells the browser to always access this via SSL. So at Black Hat Asia last year, a gentleman came up with a really cool way of doing this. Right? And we thought, well, we need to put this into MANA. And generally, this is what would happen if you use old SSL man-in-the-middle tools against a, a, modern a modern device, right? And we thought, well, that's pointless. Because if we want to intercept credentials, we need to have not have this happen. So we, Leonardo MBA, uh, last year at Black Asia, um, wrote a very cool uh, tool called, um, um, it, sorry, I forgot the name of the tool, actually. Uh, but one of the things is DNS proxy. And how it works is this. So you have a browser on your device or on your laptop. And it want, wants to connect to Google.com, right? Notice the HTTPS. How DNS proxy and SSL strip works is that SSL strip gets in, and it redirects it back to HTTP triple w.google.com. So do you notice the extra W there, right? There is no HSTS for that, right? So the browser goes, well, I've not been told about this, so that's cool. So I'm going to let them do that. Then DNS proxy handles all the DNS requests. So that's HTTP www.google.com gets redirected to our own malicious version, right? And then we can do interception there. Okay, and it gets res responded back to the browser, right? So we can now do interception. A and this works really well. So here's a video showing how it does it. So here in this one, I'm, I'm going to a site I've never been to before. And here's our captive portal. And basically, the premise is here, we need to get credentials, right? So you can log in with OAuth options, or you can just add your username and password. And so we do that. 
And we add in a hacker at gmail.com. We put the password in. I mean, it looks legit. It's, it's got a nice logo. And as everything in security today, if you don't have a logo, it's not proper research. And we go through our access log, and there's the username and password, right? So that, that's pretty cool. That should catch a few people, right? But we want more, OK? So then what we do is we decide, all right, let's go to google.com. Let's bypass HSTS. So you already noticed that the proxies changed it to www.google.com. And I'm going to try and sign in. Again, www.google.com, right? This is actually the Google page. It's just on HTTP. So I enter my details, a hacker, and a really cool secure password. Click sign in. Go through my logs. And there's my username and password. Cool. So we've got pass HSTS, which works really well. But like I said, we want to go one step further. So let's go to back to foo.com. And we like being helpful at SensePost. We thought, well, let's auto-configure the thing for the, for the user, because we think that's a nice thing to do. So now here's the question. Android does one weird thing. All Android wants from you for installing a malicious rogue CA is for you to give it a name. Uh, and it gets installed. It does tell you that this network be, may be monitored. But my rogue CA has just been put in your certificate store, OK? Which is a bit special. Um, iOS just asks for your pin code. Um, and again, happily installs it. So we think this is a bit, bit backward way of doing things, right? Devices should not just willingly accept any CER that's pushed over the wire to them and saying, well, it looks legit. I'll put that in. What's your PIN number, by the way? So we found it was really easy. And obviously, once you've got a rogue CA in there, well, then you know everything's happy. So then the next thing is FireLamb and FireSheep, right? How do we get around this? So we've now got them to connect. We've broken the you know, pre-shared key. We're going through the wire and getting all their passwords. We've gained access to, say, the corporate LAN. We're now doing the man in the middle. Problem is, we now want to look at everything going across the wire. Now, FireSheet doesn't work anymore, which is a bit annoying. So we thought, well, we need to rewrite this. And we called it FireLAM, right? Now, the cool thing about FireLAM is that it does what FireSheet used to do, right? But we decided to change it a little bit. So we wrote FireLAM to go through and use net creds and all the other password scraping tools you can on the wire. And we will build it into a per user Firefox profile for you, right? So every single time you're on a network, if it's on a busy network, we don't want to have loads of different credentials stored everywhere. We thought it'd be quite nice if we could just make one Firefox profile for Bob, one Firefox profile for Alice, and go from there. And that worked out really well. So I've got a video of FireLand working. So again, there's all my broadcast requests. I'm already on the network. I'm doing full man in the middle. You can see everything going on the, the left-hand side. So my rogue CA, rogue CA is also installed. So I'm going to go to um, accounts.google.com. It's funny. Even when you're doing videos, people type slowly. And it saved my username and password. Click sign in. Notice it's HTTPS, so I'm still doing man in the middle. I now go to Facebook.com. Notice HSTS bypass. On the left-hand side, you can still see the other sites that we're intercepting, pulling down. So we log into Facebook. Uh, and one of the biggest problems we noticed is that when we had fire for, um, MANA running in our, our test cases, and we had lots of people being intercepted, storing this data was really hard. Because if you look in the left-hand side, there's so much information going on in the past. We're like, well, how do we deal with this? We're now getting credentials raining down, but we don't have an umbrella. We don't know what to do with it. And this was one of the premises for FireLand. We wanted to make it a lot better. So 
I'm good, I've got all these certificates, what can I do next? Go through and use Facebook, do what you have to do in Facebook. Write a post. This is just to show that this is a legitimate Facebook connection going over HTTPS. That's something you always ask your mother. I've now gone into Google Mail. Anybody here use Google Mail on Android? So I'm gonna compose a message. Again, this should all be protected by certificate pinning HSTS. Right, so I'm going to go back to the machine that's running MANA, and I'm going to go into the file M option. And you'll see here, it creates a series of profiles. So it found seven cookie folders, and it does it on a MAC address or IP address. So I say, well, which one do you want to open up? And it pre-populates it into a nice Firefox profile. And then I can go there, click on Google, and it logs me in as that person's details. And it does this on a, a you know, per user basis. We do need to clean up that page a little bit. Um, there's no CSS, so it doesn't look sexy, but it's, it's one of the things that we need to do soon. So well, we finally have it. We now have credentials raining from the sky. And, and we spent about four months testing this. Like I said, we did the initial proof of concept at DEF CON last year, and there were a lot of big bug fixes. Um, and we found if it worked at DEF CON, when it came to the volume of devices, it would work anywhere else in the world. And Dominic, Ian, and myself spend a large chunk of time fixing the stuff, and it kind of works now. Um, so that's it. It's, it's available from our GitHub SensePost account, um, or and there's more details on our SensePost blog. And then the cool thing was is that we had a really nice um, kudos from uh, the Cali guys, in that they released a device called NetHunter. Anybody here got NetHunter? Cool. So the nice thing is is that NetHunter comes with one-click Mana Evil Access Point. So it was quite a cool kudos from the offensive security guys. Thank you. And just to show you here is loud, loud mode working. If it's not fallen over. No, it's fallen over, sorry. But I mean, you can see these are all the responses that I'm going through the room. Oh, it's not come up. Okay, sorry. Why is that not working? So these are every single response in the room. I'm not gonna slow it down because you probably will see some of your devices in there. Cool, thank you very much. Any questions? Cool, thanks. Yeah, you can turn your Wi-Fi on now. <laughs>